Hello and welcome to Queer Legends, an oral history podcast. I'm your host, Sean Dern, and this episode is about one of the most influential lesbians in North American history. She was out and proud and publishing stories about lesbian lives before it was even legal to be a lesbian in Canada. Her name was Jane Rule. And to talk about Jane Rule, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Linda Mora. She's an author, a professor of English at Bishop's University, and the host of her own literary podcast, Getting Lit with Linda. She's been awarded nearly a dozen Shirk grants for her research, and one of which is to research and write the biography of Jane Rule. Now, Linda, before we jump right into all of the amazing things that, that Jane did in her life, maybe just start by telling us, who is Jane Rule? It's a pleasure to be with, with you today, and thank you for inviting me. She's um, she's a well. She's well known as a kind of a writer, a novelist, uh, an activist. She's the author of the watershed novel *Desert of the Heart*. Um, and so, before *Desert of the Heart*, which was published in 1964, really lesbian fiction had not been mainstream. So it was Jane's intention to make it recognizably mainstream, and she effectively did that with that particular novel. And that was her very first novel, right? It was. First yeah, novel, was. and as I understand, like five years before uh, being gay and lesbian was decriminalized. Correct. So I think sometimes people lose sight of that fact that she took a huge risk in publishing it in at that time um, when it wasn't, it, not only was it not in vogue to do so, it was to really work against legal uh, legal impositions that were... Um, that's a better way of saying this. She was working against legal constraints. She was a radical then in many in many ways, she right? Was. She she's an interesting figure. I mean, she's someone who we could say is a radical, and she most certainly was. But she was also seeking to find a way of working within these um, mainstream currents, and so in that way, some lesbian communities wanted her to to be more radical. But that wasn't the point of of her writing, of her activism. It was to make um, being a lesbian mainstream. And so she was often in tension, working in tension with various lesbian communities. What was it that drew you to her work? Was it that or was it something something else that was like, I, I need to know more about, about this author? Rule was part of a, another project uh, initially. So I, I wrote a book called Unarrested Archives. And in this book, I selected five women, uh, five women Canadian writers who had used their archives in very strategic ways. And I discovered that Jane Rule was one of them. So I can talk about that in a minute. But in the course of my research, what I realized is I had so much more to say about her. So each chapter was about 40 pages and her, her chapter was verging on about 60. And I realized I wasn't even close to being done. And that's when I realized I need to write her biography. How long have you been working on that project? Oh my gosh! <laughs> uh, so there's not a—is there a publication date, or should I not even be asking about this yet? I'm I'm hoping to have the manuscript submitted for consideration by next year, maybe a year and a half. It takes a long time to write a biography, and it's much more complicated and much harder with someone like Rule, who really was voluminous. I mean, if I, so if I just look at, say, uh, Rick Bebu, who was working for the body politic, those letters alone are in the thousands. Right? It, it was easily over a thousand letters. So wow. if that's just one person, and so her archive holds about 70 boxes in um, at the University of British Columbia, but then there are archival deposits all over North America, California, New York, Boston. So I'm trying to track down all of these papers to write this coherent narrative line and interview key persons in her life to, to write the biography. It takes years. And in her case, she she wasn't just Canadian. She was American first and started all of her work down, exactly. down south, of course. So. Exactly. Um, we have to reconceptualize how we see Jane Rule. So she's identified as a Canadian author, but in point of fact, I like to see her as a kind of West Coast author. She was often working up and down the West Coast with communities there. When you found her handwritten autobiography oh in all of these presumably boxes, and you said 70 boxes, 
That must have been like striking gold. It was so exciting. I had to, I did a double take because the Fawn catalog showed that there was a typescript, but not a handwritten manuscript. And it was on yellow full scap. And it was clearly the earliest draft that had been saved or preserved prior to the typescript. And what it demonstrated, among other things, is that she wrote in a way that was very clean. She was a very clear thinker. Uh, this also becomes apparent when she speaks um, at the trial for the Little Sisters bookstore. Um, so when she speaks at that trial, it's the same thing. She speaks in this very coherent, lucid way. But the manuscript was so exciting. And then I had to ask myself questions like, why did she leave that there for fu- presumably for future publication? Because she could have published it herself, but she chose not to. So why didn't she? And for someone like Rule, who was extremely particular about the kinds of um, editorial interventions that are made, this is a, a, a surprising gesture. So I began to contextualize that gesture in other currents in her life. For example, um, when she was at the body politic, the body politic had been raided by the police and they made off with about 10 boxes of papers that they didn't return for, I think, eight or nine years. So she bore witness to what could happen, first of all, to an archive that was vulnerable in that way. But she also bore witness to the kinds of things that they saved and preserved. And one of the things that they saved were memoirs and autobiographies. She had already a template offered by the body politic. You've said that your research for the biography um, has kind of helped you evaluate her impact on, on what you said was the formation of a West Coast queer culture. Correct. What have you learned? Well, I'm in the process of still learning that. But it becomes really interesting to see her negotiate with communities up and down the West Coast. So we, as, a, as I say, we properly identify her as a Canadian author, but I think it's a mistake to do that because she was trying to develop networks that exceeded national boundaries that had nothing to do with uh, national understandings of identity. In point of fact, uh, she, had a, she bore a sense of identity that worked against a national understanding of identity. So the best way to work against that was to create this network that exceeded that boundary, to go up and down along the West Coast, work with different communities and publishing companies to put forward or advance a different agenda. In the late 70s, uh, when she started writing for The Body Politic, and and for listeners like who don't really know what that is yet, that is basically the the be-all and end-all of, of, of gay literature back in the day. It was a monthly publication out of Toronto, and uh, it was really radical for its day. It was talking about, you know, HIV AIDS, it was exploring gay men's sexuality. It was predominantly, you know, for gay men. And then there's Jane Rule <laughs> hopping in there with, with her with her monthly column. What was it called again? Um, so is your grandmother. Yeah, so is your, so is your grandmother. <laughs> Walk us through how Jane Rule ends up writing for what is, a, what is ostensibly a gay publication dealing with the, you know, the, the gay men's health crisis and AIDS and everything. And then here comes Jane. Yes, exactly. So she developed this friendship with Rick Bebu, who was the chief editor, if you will, of The Body Politic. And it was, a, again, an extensive, nourishing relationship. They wrote to each other all the time. They, they disagreed about various things. And it, um, it came through an invitation. I think not actually Rick Babu. One of the other members suggested that they ask her to to just write one column. It, they didn't. They weren't thinking of a regular column at first, um, and then it evolved because they were so happy with that first contribution. And she was also extremely invested in building solidarities across communities. She didn't think that they should be working in isolation. That is, um, a gay men's movement over here and lesbian communities over there. Now, saying that. Even in saying that, what happened was as she began to write that regular column, um, other members of lesbian communities began to write to the body politic and chastise Jane for working with the body politic. They felt that that was not the thing to do. And so there was a back and forth in particular between one writer by the name of Eve Zaremba um, and the title of the of the 
column that goes back and forth between the two of them is in strange with uh, in bed with strange bedfellows. And so she says that she, <laughs> <laughs> she says that she thinks that Jane has misstepped and that that this is an uh, uh, really not the correct thing to be doing. But Jane's sense was again to be to create this kind of greater movement. These communities had to work together to build that solidarity to advance their cause. And she saw that. She saw that yes, because she did. I, I recall. I mean. One, I, I've just recently watched her her um, her conversation with Timothy, Timothy Finley oh, at the yeah. 1993 uh, Vancouver Writers Fest, and it's a fantastic back and forth between these two, talking about what it's like to be coming out and so forth. But myself, having grown up on the East Coast, or East Coast, in Central Canada, in Montreal, Toronto area, um, you think of a West Coast, I had my first job out in, in BC in 1995, so two years after this, and one of the things I was first struck by with the queer community in the West mm -hmm. was that there was this greater intermingling of gays, lesbians, bisexuals, like all the letters of the alphabet soup in queerdom <laughs> were generally okay working with one another and were working together That's to it. advance everybody's human rights or everybody's battle against the police or what have you, or little sisters, we'll get to that in a moment. Yes. Um, very different compared to the rest of Canada, maybe. Yes, I, I remember, I, I actually had the opportunity to interview her in 2006, the year before she died. She was amazing. I, I went to Galliano Island, um, and she, of course, was wheelchair-bound because she was um, so arthritic at the time. Um, and so I asked her about that. I asked her about a quote I had seen in another magazine where someone had been challenging her about creating a ghetto, which is exactly what she didn't want to do. She didn't want these little ghettos. And so I said to her, so do you think that your work has accomplished more than just this ghetto? And she said, it's created a nation. She knew what she was trying to do. And I think she was quite, quite confident about what she had accomplished as well. Well, she wasn't. She wasn't in favor of same-sex marriage. She no. wasn't in wasn't in favor of of fitting in and and trying to be. In fact, I've got a quote here on my screen: "Policing ourselves to be less offensive to the majority yes. is to be part of our oppression." Yes. If the newspaper is found to be obscene, in this case, the body politic, I am part of that obscenity. Yes, she lay claim and she to it. Yes, yes. She reveled in it. She reveled in it. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. The the reference to the same sex marriage. She she actually just opposed marriage in general, and I think that's the thing to really pay attention to there. So some people think, well, how could she not want to endorse that? It's a, it's a right to which others have entitlement. But her take on it was that all marriage should be abolished. That this was a form of bondage to which no one should be subjected. And is very heteronormative. Yes, exactly. And so, in fact, it's emulating those kind of heteronormative patterns. Exactly. What do you think has been her biggest impact on mm -hmm. the queer community, be it on the West Coast or Canada at large? I would say on the West Coast more than Canada at large. That's a, a really interesting question. So she's someone who is... Um, very quietly being recovered right now. And by this, I mean that I, I know for a fact that there are, are um, a series of graduate students across the country, and not my students either, who are working on recovering and researching rules. She actually did a lot more than we fully recognize still. So that's part of the aim of the biography too, is really to assess exactly how much she accomplished and um, what she what she lay claim to, and then what actually happened. And I'm going to suggest that it's probably not so disparate as we might like to think. She's not just bragging or being overly confident. She worked hard to support the writing community across Canada, but I think that West Coast um, community was just more prevalent or more in tune with what she was trying to accomplish. She fell in love with she fell in love with Vancouver as soon as she went there. Yeah, it's not unlike her upbringing in California. That's what I think is the the, the in part the parallel for her. So before that, she had been in Concord, Massachusetts, and then went to Vancouver in part because Helen was there, but also in part she was actually this is less known, but she was actually involved with John Holcoop, who is a, a male poet. Um, yes, this is less spoken or addressed, uh, less spoken about, and less frequently addressed. 
So in part, she was motivated by being with him. But the other part was that Helen was there and she, she already knew and was in love with, I think, Helen by this point. Um, and Helen was a professor at the University of British Columbia. Yes. So, so she, um, so it was easy to, this is, this is, th this is what you've discovered through all of your research, right? Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> Do tell dish girl. Dish, well, dish. It's inter what's, what was interesting <laughs> to me in some ways were the lacuna in the research. So, um, in taking my life, she doesn't mention John Holcoop. He is nowhere to be found. And in fact, then when I re researched in her archive, I found a few letters from Holcoop, but they came in 2005, not in the 1950s. However, at the Library and Archives Canada, he kept all of her letters to him. And they are a testament to this really deep, loving relationship that she didn't otherwise address. And I speculate in um, another article elsewhere, not in Taking My Life, that the reason for this is to emphasize that narrative that she wanted about her life as a lesbian. That's how she wanted to be identified. And so it meant cutting out this element of her life. And it's, it's an aspect of her life that she was deeply proud of, but also yes. it, I would almost say it was, it was pride in, in the sense of like not needing the parade almost. Yes. Yes. There was a, you know, yes. it's like, I, this is who I am and deal with who I am. And if you don't like it, there's the door. There very much was an element of that to rule. You you have your finger on the pulse of her personality. That's exactly right. Um, she... It, it, actually com it actually comes from a, a clip. I'll play it. Do you have time? Yeah, I'll just play, play it. this clip for you. She, it's from um, their discussion in Vancouver. Uh, Jane Rule, Timothy Finley uh, at the Vancouver Writers Fest 1993. And she's talking about sort of... I, I put cue this up just as sort of a, a, an example of her unabashed lesbianism, <laughs> and 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 it's a cute story. I have a pool, and I have in the past opened it to the island children every afternoon from three to five, lifeguarding, and um, they're awfully nasty kids with strangers. They're nice with each other, but if somebody's grandson comes along who isn't part of the clique, the island kids can be awful. And part of my job is to teach them to be a little more civilized. <laughs> it, so I, I had this one perfectly nice little boy, probably 10 years old, and the other kids were not letting him in. And he was trying to be let in to the game. And one of them said, you're just a queer, you're just a faggot. And I said, <laughs> I said, I know you're using those terms because you think they're awful. Well, sure. I said, well, they're not awful. There's nothing wrong with being queer. There's nothing wrong with being a faggot. And so if you want to use them as insults, they're not. So just don't. <laughs> right? <laughs> you can hear the real confidence in her voice, too. Well, he swam off and then he came back and he hung his elbows on the deck and he looked up at me and he said, you really don't think being queer is awful? I said, no, I don't. How come? I said, because I am queer. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, with who? <laughs> To me, that that clip of, of Jane, um, when I when I heard it, I was just like, that is the woman. I mean, she is who she is. She's worked hard for everything she's she's achieved in her life. And take me or leave me. Yes, that's right. So um, first of all, there is this kind of confidence. So one of the things I have been thinking about while writing the bio the biography is that she actually came from a family that was extraordinarily wealthy, and I would even say aristocratic. Um, and I think that that actually helped to build in a kind of confidence as well. She understood that she could make these kinds of assertions and and feel that she had the authority to do that. But I don't I don't think it's just that. I think it, there is a kind of um, a personality, uh, a real confidence about who she was, and to heck with the rest of the world, uh, if they, as you say, if they didn't agree, she would flout those kinds of um, impositions, and she would make headway in so doing. And so she also did this with her own family. There was a kind of, this is at a, the moment that she identified to her family members that she was, when she came out with them, 
there was this sense of you either love me and accept me or we have nothing to say to each other. And she did it through the publication of Desert of the Heart, actually. And so, they, and they did. Her parents were wonderful with her about it. Do you find it surprising how well that novel was received? I mean, it was criticized as well, but it is arguably one of her most well-known pieces. Um, the most out there in terms of honest portrayals of lesbian relationships at a time when it wasn't something you talked about ever. It is surprising, isn't it? That it didn't get, that it didn't get panned, that it didn't get from a great resistance. It, it, it didn't. From what I, from what I've read, it was sort of more like if you just would write those honest relationships about straight people, it'd be more interesting and your book, in your books would get read more, right? <laughs> But there is this wonderful, she normalizes it. So prior to that novel, and actually even after, I, there are a couple of other, um, in my class, in my classes with my students, I was identifying how you can still see that at times with other co- more recent contemporary novels. Often what happens is, in, in this particular example, the lesbian character would be written out of the narrative or wouldn't get the happy ending. But she allows for that and demonstrates that this can be, this is this is normalizing. She that what she does with the novel is to normalize that kind of relationship. So, in in the sense, you're right. It's it's funny that there wasn't that much of a reaction. You'd think that there would be more. And then it was made into a movie by Donna Deitch, which was also received well. So it could. I think she didn't have she didn't have much to do with that, did she? She did have some some hand in that. So Donna Deitch did, I think, work with her, but largely Jane's attitude toward that was that a movie is a very different genre from a novel. And even if it were a different thing, even if it veered off and became something different than what she expected it, she respected um, she respected it as a separate entity. So she wasn't perturbed by the kind of deviations that, that were made or the, the things that surprised her. She became a, a leading name in the fight against the government and censorship uh, with Canada Customs, Little Sisters Bookshop, obviously, oh, yeah. is the, the big one there. Um, she, was she the leading charge behind, I, behind getting rid of censorship in Canada? I'm not sure that I would say she was the leading charge, but she certainly had a, a major role to play. Um, she was called to the stand as one of the writers who had been impacted by the decision to uh, detain the books at the border. And so, what, for example, one of the books was the, um, um, oh my heavens, The Young in One Another's Arms. <laughs> um, so it, Quick look at the bookshelves. <laughs> what was the book? Yeah, I was like, what was it again? It, um, it was The Young in One Another's Arms. And I think the other one was Contract with the World. And the most egregious thing in the young in one another's arms is that two lesbians exchange a kiss that's it gasp there's nothing shot yeah there's nothing (laughs) pornographic about that book at all and even that that line is a kind of it's a disputed line and so she explained in the trial the implications of randomly stopping books because of this imposed agenda that she was being made out to be a pornographer rather than an author or a writer or an artist in her own right. And so she explained that it was damaging, not only to the bookstore, but to the writers who were being affected. Um, and so she began to address the, the form of censorship that was therefore taking place. The irony of all of this, I sometimes think, is that she had left the States in the 1950s in the era of McCarthyism, comes to Canada, and then the books are being published in the States and then are being stopped at the border uh, uh, to be prevented from coming into Canada. So which place is more intolerant? I think it shows in that kind of moment. For sure. Uh, Would you suggest that that period might have been sort of like for lack of a better term, like the, the golden age of censorship, it sort of seems like that was the end. Like, were well, there's still some censorship, but I mean, like there was such a public opposition to the censorship of ideas True. by, by, by customs. It, I mean, my, I'm, I'm, I'm not as plugged into the literary world as you are. So I, I, I look to you for guidance, but it seems to me like 
things came mm-hmm. to a head right around 93, 94, 95 ish. And then like people were just not taking this nonsense any longer. Yes, I think I think that's right. I think the way to think about it is in terms of waves. So we have to remember that the the incident, more than incident, the legal fiasco or debacle with the body politic happened in the late 1970s, around I think 1977. And then this uh, this transpires by the late 1980s. The case goes to the uh, um, is taken to um, uh, to court in 1990, and so that means if you think about it in terms of waves, there's resistance and then pushback, and resistance and pushback. And so I think you're right. By the 1990s, what happens is there's this releasing, and then and then I think censorship becomes less of an issue. Was there anything really surprising that came out of your research about Jane Rule? You're going through, you. I mean, obviously you, you've stumbled across her autobiography, so there's a surprise, but that aside, like, was there anything you were like, I did not know, I can't believe I just... Well, there, there, there yes, there was the memoir, that t- uh, Taking My Life, and then there was the relationship with John Hulkoop. That threw me, I have to say. I had to take some time to digest that. But... F- I wouldn't say exactly surprises as much as the sense of a person that is not so monolithic. She's a highly complex person. And so I'm hoping that the biography shows that, that she had these kinds of commitments, but that she was engaged with people in very meaningful and complex ways. And so I hope that the book shows that. What do you think that young lesbians can take from her work or from her legacy? Oh, that's such a good question. Before I answer that, what I would say is that what I have found is interesting is how much she has not been accounted for in so many histories, um, uh, accounts of the development of lesbian communities in Canada. This deeply surprises me. And I think what they would find in someone like her is however imperfect a template or a model for someone who can live that live one's life with a sense of integrity and confidence and sureness, a kind of um, a real determination. I think they would find her quite inspiring. She was awarded the Order of Canada, the the Order of BC. I it think was. it was. What were some of her big literary awards? The people should be like, yeah, yeah, you got to go read that book and that book and that book. She didn't really win major awards. She didn't win the Governor General's Award. Um, the Geller wasn't really available then. She, her book, Taking My Life, was shortlisted for the Lambda. Mm-hmm. So there is that. But I wouldn't say, if I were to recommend books to people, I would say Taking My Life. I would say Desert of the Heart. And the one that I like, but that people often disagree with is... Um, is um, This Is Not For You, which I absolutely love. It's written in the second person. That's a very hard narrative point of view to um, to write in, and she successfully does it. It's highly impassioned and I think um, deeply emotional, deeply invested, and I think some that is off-putting for some people. But those are the three I would remark on. She was someone who is, from a literary point of view, um, very gifted. She often did used various techniques, um, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily engaging in quite the same way as as I think those three are. I appreciate all of your time with me today. Is there anything else you uh, think I should know or that others should know about Jane Rule, given that this is a podcast series about folks people probably don't know as well as they should? First, let me say thank you for having me with you on the show. It was such a pleasure to talk to you about this. But um, Otherwise, no, I think go and get Desert of the Heart. Go and get Taking My Life and read and enjoy Jane Rule's work. (laughs) And we'll leave it there. This episode was written, recorded, and produced by me, Sean Dern. Associate producer was Louisa Cruz. And the executive producer is Ian Capstick. Coming up in episode four of Queer Legends, an oral history podcast, we'll grab a cup of hot chocolate with Claudie Phileas, whose amazing black music events created space for the black gay community and changed the club scene forever. Queer Legends, an oral history podcast, is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you go for great storytelling.